Hello aviation and space fans, Sky here, and today we'll hop above the usual flight levels once again and take a look at the Earth from outer space. Our today's protagonist is a descendant of a quite renowned family, one of the main US launch vehicles and the very peculiar brainchild of, in a way, two adversary countries. Let's take a look at the American carrier rocket that is boosted by Russian engines, the Atlas V. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Ignition and liftoff of the Atlas V rocket with Cygnus, with supplies for the crew, experiments for the science. The roots of the Atlas family of rockets can be traced back to the remote 1950s, when the Convair company started working for the military on a ballistic missile capable of carrying a nuclear warhead. This is how the US got their first ICBM, the SM-65 Atlas. This name originates from the ancient Greek titan called Atlas, as well as from the Atlas parent corporation, which owned Convair back then. By modern standards, this rocket is quite small and completely obsolete, but it had quite an interesting design. In order to save weight, the engineers tried to make it as light as possible. For instance, the balloon-type fuel tanks kept their shape under the force of internal pressure. The outer shell was also made of extremely thin stainless steel, without any protective coating to keep it light. In fact, to provide it with anti-corrosion treatment, a special aerosol was developed, which surprisingly became very popular with time. Yes, it's the one and only WD-40. However, the main feature of the SM-65 was its stage and a half configuration. The rocket had three engines, the main engine and two boosters by its sides. The rocket would lose the lower module with the boosters during the stage separation phase of the flight, but the fuel tanks were shared and they remained there to feed the main engine. Considering the tiny weight of the empty tanks, it was decided that the full-grown jettisonable boosters with their own fuel tanks would only make the rocket heavier. Therefore, it would be optimal to only get rid of the massive engines. But the fuel tank is a fuel tank, and since it remained in its place, it was seen only as half a stage. This is the kind of exotics that was put on combat alert in 1957. In a cruel irony, the fast evolution of rocket design did not allow the Atlas to maintain the title of the main ICBM, and Convair went out in search of new missions for it. And they did find one. It turned out that this rocket was quite a good instrument to deliver payloads to outer space. As the time went on, the rockets were getting more and more complex and powerful. They received the Agena and Centaur boosters, which eventually were also used within the Mercury program. Usually the Redstone rocket is credited with getting the first astronauts into space, but most of the launches were carried out precisely by the Mercury Atlas pair. Further usage of these rockets also turned out to be very effective. The military, who in their time got several hundreds of these ballistic missiles, were rapidly getting rid of them, and the manufacturer, after making some necessary tweaks, was delivering them to launch operators. This is how the Atlas ended up delivering military and civilian space vehicles to the Earth orbit and to outer space, including the Moon, Venus and Mars. Later the rocket was replaced by a new generation, the Atlas II, which would be actively used until the end of the 20th century. But at the same time, the engineers who designed this rocket and were now part of Lockheed Martin took on a major redesign. The Atlas III became the heir who went to fulfill the mission of its ancestors. However, it is worth mentioning that even though it is considered to be part of the family, it really is almost an entirely new model. New times, new design. The interesting yet overly exotic stage and a half configuration was left behind to make space for the more classic two-stage versions. The second stage was a modernized version of the Centaur booster. Meanwhile, the first stage was made from scratch. And for the first time, the RD-180 engines by the Russian Energomash Corporation were used. The 1990s were getting into high gear, just like the big love between Russia and the USA. And initially, the rocket was even designed under the name Atlas IIAR, where the R stood for Russia. The main engine and the entire launch vehicle were showing some great results. The rocket, with a launch mass of about 215 tons, or 470,000 pounds, could deliver to a low Earth orbit a payload weighing about 10 tons, or 23,000 pounds. Not bad for a relatively small carrier. 
Atlas III was used between the years 2000 and 2005, making six launches. At first glance, that may seem like a failure, but what really happened was that the engineers decided that they could get more out of this machine, and created a new version, the Atlas V. Finally, we go to our today's main hero. Atlas V is a heavy class space launch vehicle developed by Lockheed Martin Corporation and one of the main rockets used by the United Launch Alliance, or ULA, a joint venture between Lockheed Martin and Boeing. Yes, the mortal enemies in aviation have a bromance in the space industry. In general terms, the overall concept of the Atlas V is a direct evolution of the concept seen in the Atlas III. The rocket has two main stages, with some additional solid fuel boosters. Let's take a closer look at its design. The first stage of the rocket is called a Common Core Booster, or CCB. Why Common Core? The thing is that initially, the rocket was meant to be modular. Three large CCBs were to be connected to make up a heavier launch vehicle. This scheme can be seen in such rockets as Delta IV, Angara, and Falcon Heavy. However, the story took a different route, and the Atlas V Heavy never made it further than the blueprints. So, the CCB simply remained as the first stage, 32.5 meters or 106 feet high, and 8.3 meters or 12.5 feet wide. It is fueled by the combination of kerosene and liquid oxygen. Its power plant is made up of the Russian RD-180 engine. I think we can take a deeper dive into this matter. After all, a Russian engine on an American rocket is something you don't see every day. But we'll have to start off with its mighty ancestor, the RD-170, one of the most powerful rocket engines ever created. It was meant to be used in the boosters of the Super Heavy Energia carrier, and with some minor modifications in the Zenith rockets. Don't get confused by the amount of nozzles, the engine has four chambers. Based on this design, the RD-180 was created in the 1990s as a smaller version with two chambers. 3.83 meganewtons at sea level is a huge thrust, so Atlas has plenty of power with just one RD-180. Besides, the impressive thrust of this engine comes along with high efficiency, small dimensions, reliability and quite a low price tag, so it's not surprising that Lockheed Martin was over this engine like an alley cat in heat. The engines were sold via RD Amros, the joint venture of Energamash and Pratt Whitney. Lockheed Martin then modified these engines according to their needs and started fitting them first on the Atlas III and then on the Atlas V as well. The first stage, with the RD-180 engines, works for about 253 seconds after being launched. In some versions, it doesn't work on its own, but with the support of side boosters. So, the Atlas V can get up to five AJ-60A solid fuel side boosters, made by Aerojet Rocketdyne. In their basic configuration, each of these boosters is 17 meters or 55.8 feet high, weighs about 46 tons or 102,000 pounds, and reaches 1700 kilonewtons of thrust during one and a half minutes. Actually, this rocket might also receive the new Gem-63 boosters by Northrop Grumman. They have similar specs, but more prospects. In fact, these boosters should be used on the future Vulcan rocket, which is being developed by the ULA, as well as on the Omega rocket, developed by Northrop Grumman itself. Now it's time to get a bit higher. Over the first stage, we can see some adapters that connect it to the second stage. The diameter of the second stage is just 3 meters, or 10 feet, which is a bit less than that of the first one, so the rocket did not get a monolith shape, having a small ledge. The second stage is a modification of the Centaur stage that was made 1.7 meters or 5.5 feet longer. After all, now its missions got trickier, with higher precision launches of heavier payloads to orbits, including the geostationary one. To be able to do that, the module got a more advanced control system, which keeps all of the rocket in check throughout the entire flight. There is a choice of power plants. It can be either a single RL-10 engine, versions A or C, or a couple of RL-10A engines with 100 kN or 22,300 pounds of thrust each. The engines are fueled by the combination of liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. They are meant to function in vacuum and can be restarted multiple times. Above the second stage, the payload is placed. 
Atlas V can deliver up to 18.9 tons or 41,000 pounds of payload to the low Earth orbit or 8.9 tons or 19,600 pounds to the geostationary transfer orbit, which is not bad at all. It is a full-fledged heavy class rocket, even though there are those who consider it to be kinda small. Something like a little brother of the gargantuan Delta IV Heavy. Obviously, the payloads are covered by fairings, which come in different shapes. The basic fairings share the same diameter of 4.2 meters, a dimension that can be traced back to the Atlas II rockets. Yet there are different lengths, 9, 10 and 11 meters. Eventually, a new carbon fiber fairing was developed, with a diameter of 5.4 meters and length of 20.7, 23.4 and 26.5 meters. All of these fairings are manufactured by the Swiss Ruach Space, which in addition to Atlas also works with such rockets as Vega, Falcon 9, Arian 5, Falcon Heavy… Well now, seems like the Pilatus planes are not the only flying things from Switzerland. What's interesting is that unlike the small fairings that cover up only the payload, the bigger ones also cover the entire Centaur module. Even though the original plans of creating a module rocket did not come to life, the Atlas V still has lots of variants and there is a special system that helps tell them apart. Each rocket has a three digit index. The first one stands for the fairing series, where 4 is designated to a small diameter fairings and 5 to the big ones. The letter N can also be used if instead of a usual payload a piloted vehicle is launched, but this version has been used just once so far, when the Boeing Starliner was launched. The second digit stands for the number of solid boosters used, it ranges between 0 and 5. Finally the third digit stands for the number of engines on the second stage, 1 or 2. For instance, the top of the line Atlas V of the 552 version has a large fairing with a diameter of 5.4 meters, 5 boosters and the Centaur module with 2 engines. The first launch took place in August 2002 and the new rocket successfully orbited the Hotbird satellite of the Utilsat network. In general, the Atlas V turned out to be quite a reliable machine. By March 2020, this rocket has been launched 83 times, 82 of which are considered to be a total success and just one was partially successful, even though the satellite was put in orbit and started operation. The rocket is actively used to launch into orbit commercial and military payloads, as well as in research missions. In fact, Atlas V was the one to launch such space vehicles as Solar Orbiter to research the Sun, MAVEN, MRO and MSL to study Mars, the OSIRIS-REx for asteroids and of course the New Horizons that provided us with detailed images of Pluto. In addition to that, the Atlas rockets delivered the sketchy Boeing X-37 spaceship on its first four missions. The ULA's rockets and launch services never stood out with their low prices, so the Atlas V is by no means cheap. The starting price of this rocket varies around 100 million dollars, while the top versions easily go over 150 million. And this is on the civil market. The services provided to NASA and the US military can cost tens of millions of dollars more, although they are much more demanding to the operators. However, the relaxed work at extreme prices was messed up big time by the guys from Hawthorne. With its reusable heavy rockets, SpaceX has plummeted the price of launch services. The Russians tend to think that this is all being done to mess with Roscosmos, but the reality is that the guys from ULA surely mention Elon Musk in a much more rude manner. If you think that 100, 150 million dollars is still extremely expensive, have no doubt that before the arrival of the Falcon 9, the prices ranged well over 200 million and had no intention of going down. The rocket is constantly being modernized, improving its performance and adapting to new realities. After establishing the United Launch Alliance, Lockheed Martin and Boeing initiated joint research to create new systems for their already shared Atlas V and Delta IV rockets. Obviously, it was not possible to completely unify them, but they do share a series of control system modules. One of the main projects and let's say dreams the designers of this rocket had ever since it was created is its potential use to deliver to outer space not only payloads but also astronauts. This became an especially hot topic after the closure of the space shuttle program and ULA has been actively working to certify its carrier vehicle for manned launches and this work is still in progress. 
Atlas V became the basic carrier for the Boeing CST-100 Starliner, and it was the rocket used to carry out the first test flight of this spaceship. Not to say that things went smooth as butter, but the rocket did its job. Hence, in the near future, precisely the Atlas V, along with Falcon 9, will be the new carrier of American manned spacecraft. Nevertheless, the V is not immune to time, and ULA is now developing a new launch vehicle dubbed as Vulcan. It is expected to become an entire family of rockets, with the heaviest versions being capable of delivering to orbit payloads up to 35 tons, 77,000 pounds. Some of their systems will be unified with Delta IV rockets, and they will feature the updated Centaur IV second stages. At the same time, the first stages will be completely new. They will be filled with a mix of liquid oxygen and liquid methane to fuel the new BE-4 engines from Blue Origin. Later on, the engineers of Jeff Bezos will also fit these engines on their own new Glenn rocket. Solid boosters will also be replaced. Now it will be possible to fit up to six improved boosters Gem 63 XL. The first launch is scheduled for 2021. Obviously, the main innovation of the new rocket will be the replacement of the RD-180 engines with the BE-4s. Of course, apart from a series of technical nuances, there is also a clear political agenda in this change. After a sudden disenchantment in relations between Russia and the United States that took place in recent years, the mutual dependence in the field of space was a cause of discontent in both countries. Politicians on both ends demanded to seize this disgraceful cooperation. But both sides found themselves in an intricate situation. On one hand, ULA cannot simply replace the RD-180s with some other engines. This will put the Atlas V program on halt while the Vulcan is still not ready. On the other hand, the sales of the RD-180 are an important revenue source for Russian manufacturers. The situation becomes even more ridiculous upon taking a closer look at the statistics of the payloads launched by Atlas rockets. Half of them were put into orbit to serve the interest of the US military. So it turns out that either the US defense system was built with the machinery of a potential enemy, or that by delivering its engines all along, Russia was essentially a subcontractor in the creation of the defense system of a potential enemy. Now that's what I call the intricacy of globalization. So, the rocket-themed Romeo and Juliet love story will remain alive for some time. And that's the ironic closure of our today's rocket story. Like the video and subscribe to the channel, and may only the civilian rockets fly above your heads. Fast flights and soft landings to you.